speakers will be for this track. This track is the breaking track, and on the other side of that wall, we'll have the building track. And before that, we we're going to do some opening remarks. So we wanted to thank all of you for coming to the third annual Bay Threat, the hacker con in the South Bay. Uh, we started this con mostly because uh, the people that were organizing it were tired of traveling across country for all of the conferences we were going to. So we thought that we would have a conference in the Bay Area bringing the best talks all over the world here to us. And so far this year, I think we did a pretty good job of it. Um, I just wanted to thank our sponsors right off the bat. The sponsors for Bay Threat are really great. They're always the ones that send engineers, not salespeople, and they really support us. And a lot of the sponsors are you guys, the people here today. So thank you so much to our sponsors. Uh, Gigamon, Cloud Passage, Facebook, Salesforce, AppSec, Alien Vault, Hot One, Risk.io, Matasano, Stack and Lou, Packet Storm, and uh, No Starch and Source Ninja. All of these guys have people here today and they've all been really supportive. So we actually have something new that we're doing this year where on that wall and this wall over here we have QR codes that link directly to our, um, our sponsors' sites. So if you want to do something a little interactive this year, check out our sponsors' pages. Uh, just a few more logistical things. Uh, today and tomorrow we're going to have lunch breaks that will be here. Um, we also have here this evening a happy hour starting at 6 p.m. downstairs. Uh, there's coffee now and throughout the day behind the bar here. And uh, in the afternoon we're going to have a long break that will have coffee, snacks, and more food. The last logistical thing that I wanted to mention to all of you is parking. Uh, there's lots of different kinds of parking, so be sure that you know the, the time slot for your parking. And we've built long breaks throughout the day, so if you need to go change your parking, be sure to set yourself an alarm and go just move your parking spot. Third and fourth floor on the Macy's parking garage, you can park there all day. So during maybe one of the first few breaks, if you want to go move your car. Other than that, um, I think we're going to get started right away. So if everyone's ready, in the breaking track, we have Christy Dudley with a talk, Who Will Your Car Betray You? And in the building track, we have Chort with my first incident response team, DFIR for Beginners. Thanks, everyone, for coming. I hope you have a great day. I guess I'll let people finish their conversations. <laughs> okay, I'm got a lot of feedback. Um, a little trouble with the microphones here today. Um, hopefully, we'll get it straightened out. It's pretty loud here, so if you could try and keep it down, um, that'd help out a lot. Um, there's a lot of noise and a lot of background, so. Okay, I'm here to talk about um, will your car betray you? 
Uh, your car right now, um, I'm not looking at anything that's going on with vehicles right now. Um, I'm looking at uh, new technologies that the auto manufacturers are talking about rolling out. And um, the, uh, man, that's distracting. <laughs> and, and, Yes. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Figured out the problem. <laughs> That's a good call. <laughs> I hadn't noticed that. That noise down there is really distracting. The, well, if you could let him. <laughs> right. Well, that speaker. It's yeah. <laughs> probably. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Staying more on that side. Okay. Um, so I'm talking about new technologies that the automakers are contemplating, but um, are still in the testing phases. Um, first of all, um, who am I? I have a BSWE and uh, worked in networking, digital communications for a long time. Um, and I got kind of bored with that, so I went to law school. That's what everybody does when they get bored, right? Um, and when I, uh, when I was working and talking with people, I found a professor who was very interested in privacy, which goes along with my interests, and she asked me to do uh, technical research for her on her privacy audits and various projects that she worked on for ensuring um, privacy. So uh, what I'm looking at here is something I was specifically contracted by a consortium of automakers working with the National Highway Transportation Safety Board uh, to um, look at building. So start with a standard disclaimer. I'm not a lawyer yet, um, but that doesn't really matter anyway for this presentation because it's mostly technical. Um, my non-standard disclaimer is um, I am still working under an NDA. However, most of this stuff is standards development, which is public knowledge. So I can talk about anything that's available by some other way than what I signed the NDA for. So there's a lot available for me to talk about, but there are a few specific areas um, still under development that aren't. OK, so what is this thing that I'm talking about? It's um, uh, dedicated short-range communications. Um, basically, a network of radios where cars are broadcasting information um, about where they're going, what they're doing, um, for the safety. The World Health Organization estimates that 25% of deaths uh, due to accidents could be um, eliminated if they dealt with the inattentive uh, driver problem. So uh, that's 25% of the leading killer in the United States. So, um, so the challenges that this radio system faces is that if you have cars broadcasting safety information, then you need um, enough density with enough cars broadcasting this information. Because the point is that, that the information, the, the value is not um, in what you send, it's in what you receive. So if, if you don't have a lot of people um, sending good data, then you won't, you won't derive the benefit from it. Um, and another thing is you have to have good data. If you have somebody who's been tinkering with their um, radio, then uh, you need to be able to ignore those messages and know how um, malicious actors or other people, um, it, that their messages are bad. Um, so National Highway Transportation Safety Board is talking about contemplating a mandate for this technology, meaning that every vehicle by, their, they're talking about something like 2025 to 2030, um, will be required to have this technology. Um, so it's kind of alarming if you think about it from a privacy standpoint that you're mandated to have this technology 
and, um, and it's broadcasting information about you without your ability to control it. So what is it? Um, uh, it's a series of IEEE standards um, and uh, SAE standards as well. Um, it's based on a, or the idea is that it generates basic safety messages. And they spend a lot of time talking about these basic safety messages. It's just a big data glob with um, a predefined value set um, so, that, um, so that each vehicle can tell the other vehicles. Um, got quiet. <laughs> uh, each vehicle can tell the other vehicles um, location, size, et cetera. Um, so what, what this is not, I've kind of touched on this, um, it's, it's not connected to your CAN bus. There's a lot of uh, talk about. We're not, people that? can't really hear you with that. OK. That well, so just keep yeah, that it, it's really loud yeah, down and, there. And so. so if you project right into okay. that. OK, can you hear me now? <laughs> OK, um, uh, what, what this is not. Uh, it's not connected to your CAN bus. It's, I know a lot of people, there's a lot of um, effort to uh, hack CAN buses and, and like the Bluetooth tire pressure interface and all that. So we're not worried about that. Uh, the automakers realize that this is the, uh, the old technologies, even the OnStar that is a uh, popular hack these days, even the OnStar is, is no longer or is not uh, trusted, particularly since that's proprietary. So um, I was working with nine different auto manufacturers. You still can't hear me. Okay. Um, I can't get any closer to the microphone than this. <laughs> um, hey guys, downstairs. You're really loud and people can't hear me up here even with a microphone. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so it's not Canvas. It's not. What's interesting about this is it's not a routed network. Uh, and so it, it, um, it's, it's not a routed network, so um, a lot of the problems that you see with um, the internet are not, um, are not an issue. Okay. And it also, currently, as proposed, it's not commercial, although there's some talk about that. So, um, the basic safety message, it includes uh, position, uh, the size of the vehicle, acceleration in three dimensions as well as yaw, uh, uh, information about your transmission, the state of your transmission, the speed, acceleration, um, uh, path history and prediction. So, uh, the position of the steering wheel, all these things are fields in the basic safety message, and so they're transmitted with a value um, for every 10 seconds that these um, messages are sent out. Um, the format for these messages um, is, I, I kind of cut this up. Um, the format is about, uh, hey guys, you're loud. There's a real noise problem here. Okay, um, what's uh, missing from these messages is um, that there's no addressing. It's just a series of values of fields or, or fields for um, the location and position of the car. Um, it's, uh, it, there's no individually identifiable information other than the exact location and time. So if you're trying to predict um, a, a network, and this is why I say that it's unroutable, because these basic safety messages um, don't include any information that you can use to target a destination. Um, and so I'm putting forth, there's, there's been a lot of noise within the consortium. Okay, um, uh, RMS has been complaining about this. Let's open source the application and um, Unfortunately, open sourcing an application that uh, interfaces with basic safety messages is kind of useless if you're talking about privacy, because that's not where the privacy is. Um, what they expect is they expect you to trust the radio. Um, 
uh, uh, the phrase up there, I, I heard all the time when I was working with these people, why, why would anybody want to hack this? What's going on? <laughs> Other than um, just to have done it and then you get bored with it and move on because you can't do anything useful or meaningful. And so I came up with a list of things for that. But um, they, it, looking into the back end of this, um, there's a, a lot that needs to be done and can be done to look at it. Um, I would like to say that the protocols as developed seem pretty solid. When, when they were talking about the um, uh, broadcast frame for the uh, for the wireless communications. They initially, when they uh, started the standard, they had a source address. Oh, hey, yay! <laughs> thank. You. Oh, thank you. Um, they they had a source address that. Um, that um, every, every message had, and it was fixed. And um, they went through all this trouble to try and um, uh, hide the identity of the broadcaster, but they required it to have a source address. So it's like, why, why even um, go through the effort? So they fixed that. Um, and so they still have the ability for um, fixed infrastructure to have a source address. So if you have like a roadside equipment or something like that, um, then, then they, they can target that. But you can't target vehicles because um, there's no way to identify them. Um, so, so the protocols are, are pretty solid for what the protocols cover. Um, but what the protocols don't cover, um, all right, back up a slide. Um, what the protocols don't cover is uh, um, the signing. Uh, the, part, of, part of the idea is, I talked earlier about trust. Um, what, what the idea is, is each, um, each message that's sent out is digitally signed with a certificate. These certificates, there's a lot of debate about how often they should be reused, if you should just use one continuously, one per trip, one per whatever, um, and so I've made some recommendations on that, but um, you have certificates to identify that you, you're coming from a valid thing, but um, they haven't figured very much out about these certificates, um, other than the uh, vehicle maintaining a store, um, sometimes changed, um, and um, The proposals, um, it's, it's still up in the air. So um, the problem about uh, the, the they, they were talking about building these things with enough memory to store certificates for three years. And so you didn't have to update your certificates every three years, which I don't know about you, but you know, if a certificate gets revoked, um, then, um, how are you going to even know about it if you don't update for three years? So um, the, it kind of makes the whole system useless if you're not going to actually update. They didn't even think about that. So um, where do these certificates come from is another thing they haven't figured out. Who generates them? They've been doing test beds, and they did a road test up in Ann Arbor, Michigan with um, uh, several thousand vehicles, um, all volunteers, um, and they chose um, for density, maximum density in a geographic area. Um, so, um, but they, they had aftermarket install type things and um, they just installed everything with all the certificates preloaded. They just assumed everything would be like that. So they haven't worked out all the details on, on how these devices are going to get the certificates in the first place. Um, it, the certificates are key to the device ID so that if you revoke a device certificate, then you publish the device ID and everybody can um, uh, reverse the, the certificates from that. Um, but the, the question is, can these device IDs be correlated to people? Um, I'm 
I believe they shouldn't, um, and I imagine a lot of privacy advocates would agree because um, that means that it, it makes it a really, really tasty morsel for um, law enforcement um, to start following people around, and we already have plenty of battles on that. Um, so um, they haven't even figured out how to load these. So the back-end interface um, it, infrastructure of who generates the tickets, um, where, um, what kinds of organizations, there have been discussions. The government can't afford to do it because that's infrastructure and we're looking at some budget cliffs and so forth. So uh, the, uh, they're trying to find ways that, um, that don't, um, they're trying to find ways that don't uh, uh, cost money to the government. And, and they've talked about, oh, let's do advertising to pay for this. Or let's do, <laughs> it's like, okay. And, and they, they, how do you connect to this infrastructure? Uh, their, their favorite thing right now is cellular. Um, okay, you can turn the cellular off when you're not using it, so you can't totally be tracked. But you do have your MZ, and you can, that's a, it, as good as um, broadcasting your device ID periodically. Uh, and they, it never even occurred to them that that might be a problem. So anyway, um, what's uh, uh, particularly worrisome for the future is that these commercial, they're, they're talking about of funding with this with advertising, but they're also talking about really encouraging people to use this platform because it's new and exciting and, and the potential is so big for commercial apps. Well, remember that routing problem that I talked about by not having a, an address on your EndNote? Well, they're gonna, if they try to do this, then they're going to be working to undermine the, the privacy of the system. Um, another worrisome thing is integration with public transit systems. Um, transit systems are bad enough with tracking your uh, positioning, although um, if you could integrate um, uh, like train information and your car would be blaring at you not to stop on the tracks, that's not such a bad idea. Um, what worries me the most though is um, the talk about fixed infrastructure. Um, it's a really clever idea to have your lights controlled by um, by this radio that's a 320 meters distance so you can tell if somebody's coming to your intersection and so they don't ever have to wait for a red light. But um, we have red light cameras. And this is just so much easier to and so much more accurate. Uh, somebody's broadcasting this data. Um, this, some more information is this, this is broadcasting speed data. Um, sure, you'd have to correlate it back to an I identity, but um, speed cameras don't work right now because it's so hard to calibrate the, the speed detection. Here you don't need speed detection, and you have it telling you the vehicle was exactly where your camera that was taking the picture of the license plate was. So um, the, the fixed infrastructure is the biggest problem for adoption because people are going to, and this is one of the things that uh, National Transportation Safety Board was really concerned about. They, they had to work with seat belts and all the ways different people could foil their seat belt efforts. And that was before the internet was available to share information about this. So they realize that they're going to have to build um, consumer confidence um, in order to, make, to get the density and the integrity to this system to make it work. Um, so if they have policemen in small towns using this as speed cameras, people will sabotage it. If they have all these other issues, people will sabotage it. And they, um, it's important to get it right or it's not going to be a functional system. And so I kind of bring a challenge to everybody here, and that is um, I'd like to invite you to hack this. And I'd like to invite you to um, get it known that this system is, um, is a threat 
and get these threats addressed because I think it's very, a very useful system that could save hundreds of thousands of lives. Um, but it needs, they need to get it right. Um, IEEE standards, anybody can help work on those. And these are standards under development, so and that have not been deployed in the field yet. Um, so I'd like to invite everybody to participate and get, get involved in, in making this a, a better um, system. So anyway, um, questions? <laughs> if you heard much of that, it's <laughs> a little challenging. So. Um, uh, does anybody have any questions that, uh, about the... Uh, do, Okay, um, 802.11p and uh, 1609 are the primary standards. Um, they considered and rejected the ISO standards that they were working on, uh, just like the internet did. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, I was just wondering: uh, Is there any talk about what's happening internationally, or is this all is this all domestic? Okay, that's actually a very good question. Um, the consortium I work with is an, a group of international automakers, three Japanese, three European, and three American. Um, and they would really like this to be a universal harmonized system, one system worldwide. Um, Japan's not gonna happen. Japan's going to do their own thing because if for no other reason than they have different spectrum available. Um, Europe and the United States, um, DSRC is dedicated spectrum owned by the Department of Transportation. Um, in Europe, that same spectrum is available for transportation use as well. So there's actually a good chance this is going to roll out in Europe before it rolls out in the United States because they're a little bit further ahead on the standards. But it's the same automakers. They really want to make it a harmonized system worldwide. So, any other questions? <laughs> okay then. Well, I thank you very much, and I'm really sorry about the sound on the speech. Um, if you have any questions, I'll probably be around for the rest of the day. So, thank you very much. <laughs>